This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We are less than 24 hours away from the opening tee times for this year's U.S. Open at Pinehurst number two, and it is time to dig in and help you fill out your bet slips for the third major of the year. We're going to have Brandon Gadula on today to break down his thoughts on the U.S. Open. We'll talk Scotty Scheffler, top outrights, top non-outrights, and more to get you ready for the U.S. Open. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of Digital Media. Media for FanDuel Research. Joined here, as mentioned by Brandon Gadula. You can find him on X at Gadula13. Find his work at FanDuel Research, where he is a senior managing editor. Brandon, happy U.S. Open Week to you. How are you doing today? I'm good. We talked yesterday about the event on our other podcast. Well, I don't want to say our other podcast because this is not my podcast, but your yeah. other podcast. I think we all claim ownership of this. You're good. Well, I'm sure you've said stuff on here that I don't want associated with. So, <laughs> fair enough. Some of these takes, some of these takes. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I had even longer to think about this week and kind of settling in with a little bit of clarity. But you know, it's a major, and there that means that naturally there are a lot of logical winners out there, especially at this setup. I think it's it's going to be a really fun week and. Hopefully, we can kind of narrow things down as we talk through Pinehurst number two. I agree with this up. There are a lot of logical winners, but also there is a guy who is plus 280 to win for this week in Scotty Scheffler. So I agree with your sentiment. We're going to have to discuss Scotty to lead things off. We'll do that. We'll talk about Pinehurst number two, what to know about this course, top outrights, and much more in just one second. But first, as a reminder, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. If you want some thoughts on game three between the Mavs and Celtics for tonight, you can find that via Austin Swaim on Monday show. We talked about series prices for Mavs Celtics and game three specifically on Monday show that is available on uh, the cover in the spread podcast feed, FanDuel TV plus and the FanDuel YouTube page. Also, Brandon mentioned we do have our other podcast, the heat check available on the FanDuel research podcast feed. We talked through, I went through my top bets there as well. If for some reason you want to find out what those are, you can check out those there, but also we did talk DFS for the U.S. Open. So a more in-depth preview of the U.S. Open is available on the FanDuel Research Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. The NBA Finals are here, and FanDuel's giving you the chance to win alongside the champions because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with a winning $5 bet. That is $200 used on same-game parlays, live bets, and so much more. There is no better place to bet all the finals action than America's number one sports book. Just download the app and take a shot at an extra 200 bucks. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 18 plus in DC and 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $5 first deposit required. Bonus issued is non withdrawable bonus bets, which expire seven days after receipt. Restricted supply, see terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, D.C., Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, Vermont, Virginia, and Wyoming. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org slash chat Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700. KSGamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit MDGamblingHealth.org in Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia. Hope is here. Visit GamblingHelplineMA.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope and y in New York. Now, Brandon, let's begin things here by talking about the course for this U.S. Open. It is Pinehurst number two, last hoped, hosted a U.S. Open back in 2014. So limited data on this course, but general vibes, we can kind of figure out what to expect here. So what should we know about Pinehurst number two for this week? Yes, yeah, so it's a really long par 70. Uh, it's over 7,500 yards. Uh, this isn't 100% up to date but 
basically like in the last five years or so is about the second longest uh, par 70 we've seen uh, Southern Hills, the, the site of the 2022 PGA was longer. That's the, that was the, the Mito Pereira meltdown and uh, the Justin Thomas come from behind win, which was nice for me. Not, not so great for uh, Mito, but we're looking at a really long par 70 and the way that distance is made up, I think, is always interesting when it comes to a golf course. Sometimes it's a couple of exorbitantly long holes, but in this case, it's kind of a lot of long par fours. Uh, the par fours average around 460 yards. So on average, about 30 yards longer than your average par four on the PGA Tour. Uh, seven of them are over 470 so it's sort of more of a relentless situation in terms of how we're getting this distance at Pinehurst. However, however, firm and fast conditions should be expected here. Uh, so this course underwent a restoration in at 2010. So between, uh, you know, before the, the last U.S. Open here in 2014, rendering the the earlier two in, in 1995 and 2005 a little bit less impactful in terms of our course research. But, you know, in that restoration, uh, they took out some sprinklers, kind of changed things up, and there's going to be a lot of rollout. And you're going to see, there, you know, this course is littered with bunkers. Uh, the GCSAA uh, lists 117, which is basically the same as Pebble, um, just sand everywhere, native areas everywhere, wire grass everywhere. So whenever you apply rollout and firm conditions to distance, basically it kind of mitigates that a little bit and helps the shorter hitters get more rollout. But also that kind of comes into play where you're going to have to manage your rollout in certain situations and not roll out into native areas. So it's going to be a tough test off the tee. You're going to have to hit it in the right spot. Um, Victor Hovland did say like you need to be aggressive off the tee to set up for the right approaches. So I think strokes gained off the tee is going to be very vital, as we talked about uh, yesterday. But even more so, the more the more I think about it and the more I see about this course. So I think you're going to have to be able to drive the ball uh, pretty well. But you know, more with this course, it, it's going to play just difficult. It's going to be, I think, like sort of relentless is is a good term for it. Yeah, Martin Keimer won at nine under back in 2014, but that was eight shots better than Ricky Fowler and Eric Compton, the only other two golfers who were under par. So we're probably looking at a winner around even par. And, you know, these greens are going to be fascinating. They are larger than average uh, for the PGA Tour, but they are really undulating, you know, fronts that are going to run into sticky situations. I said this yesterday too. just do yourself a favor and search on YouTube for some Pinehurst number two footage. You, it won't take long and you'll get a, a good feel for how difficult this course is going to play. So again, I think unrelenting can't have holes in your game for pretty much any major, but I think this week especially. So in terms of like key stats, what I want, I need I need good ball strikers first and foremost. So I want strokes gained approach. I want strokes gained off the tee. I need around the green play because you're going to have to have some creative shots. And yes, putting, but I think putting is going to be, it's going to be more about saving par, maybe saving bogey than it is kind of sinking long putts. So I need it all uh, for the most part. And you'll find in most instances for the players I'm on, they have a pretty well-rounded game for this week. So let's talk about a player whose game is very well-rounded and Scotty Scheffler. As Scheffler is not surprisingly the betting favorite, he is plus 280 at FanDuel Sportsbook, and that is a very short number. So I feel like before we talk about anything else, it's important to discuss our view of Scheffler because that kind of dictates how you handle things elsewhere. So when we talked about Scheffler in the past, both for the Masters and for the PGA Championship, the thought process was, yes, his odds are short, but he's pretty close to being a fair value. How do you view Scheffler plus 280 for this week? So between talking yesterday on Tuesday and today, we had a, a withdrawal with John Rahm. And so I had to rerun everything, relook at everything. 
unfortunately, John Rom was not someone who was soaking up a lot of value and he was helping create more value um, on the for the rest of the board in terms of how my model saw it. But also, I don't think too many people were that interested in Rom, but he's dealing with a blister, uh, had to withdraw. And so that kind of caused a little bit of a cascading effect, although Scheffler's odds didn't change. So some of the win equity from Rom just gets dispersed. So like it kind of helped out with Scotty in that sense, but still I have him around plus 350. I understand why he's plus 280. Uh, it's so hard to make a case against Scotty Scheffler, but for me, I can't quite get there. It is just sort of outrageous how good Scheffler is over the last 50 rounds, according to data golf and all these stats adjust for field strength. Scotty's first in strokes gain tee to green, second off the tee, first in approach and seventh around the green. And of course the putting is, you know, what we need to talk about with Scheffler, but he's 48th in that span. And if you're that good tee to green, you can be, top 50 you can be slightly average you can be slightly above average and the thing is the underlying splits are good and they're getting better since he switched his putter over the full pga tour season and unfortunately on the pga tour website it's not very easy to split things out into recent rounds uh he's a 53rd percentile putter from within 15 feet and that's a critical range those are the more makeable putts it helps weed out a lot of the putting luck based on the research I've done. So I'll just leave it at this. You can't make a case against Scotty Scheffler this week. The only thing is the odds this week are, I, I kind of want to say finally, because every time we talk about Scotty Scheffler, the odds have been reasonable this yeah. week. I think they're just a little bit too short. It does feel like, I mean, he's the man. So it does throw a wrench into all of these other outrights which is why I think maybe an alternate market without Scotty Scheffler is also worth looking into, but that's kind of where I am with Scheffler. I, I, sh I wouldn't talk anyone out of it, but in terms of the pure value, I, for the first time in a while, I, I would probably advise against it. Do you know the last time Scotty Scheffler lost strokes putting? No, it was that, that, you know, remember when he chucked the ball into the woods? And then yes. he switched his putter the next week. He has not yeah. lost strokes putting since then. Like it's insane. Uh, ever since that change, he's been, he's, his results are win, win, second, win, win, eighth, when he got arrested, <laughs> second and win. So like he's a cyborg. And you mentioned that there are ways to get around that. There is a market at FanDuel Sportsbook of a winner without Scotty Scheffler market. And that does, uh, affect things because obviously you're taking out a lot of win equity based on your Sims. 22% of the win equity is evaporated there based on FanDuel Sportsbook's odds is 26%. Is Scotty close enough to being a fair value where you think that is the better market to dive into this week? Or do you want to take advantage of the fact that Scheffler's implied odds are about four percentage points above his actual odds and instead go with the actual regular market instead? I mean, I like both but there's something to be said knowing you can still get solid numbers on golfers and don't have to worry if Scotty goes out and just proves that he's the best golfer in the past like quarter century. Um, you know, you don't want to necessarily make all your decisions based on fear, but you also want to be logical. And right. for me, I can run my simulation model without Scotty in this. And because he is relatively close and because the odds on Fandle Sportsbook kind of just scale with removing Scotty from the equation, the golfers I like with Scotty at these new odds also are some golfers that I like. I have Xander Schauffele as a value outright. I have him at seven to one. If you remove Scotty from this field, that's where he is on Fandle Sportsbook. I would be okay with that. Colin Morikawa is a name that I like. I have him plus 1150. He's 12 to one in this market. Um, and then Matt Fitzpatrick, I talked about all around golfers. He doesn't do anything that's phenomenal. 
but he's 35 to one here. I could see him playing this course. Well, he played here in 2014. I'm not putting a lot of stock into who played here in 2014, but it definitely doesn't hurt if you, if you played here and played relatively well. I mean, he made the cut when he was 10 years younger. Um, look, they're going to say 10 very, years very, old. And I was like, I'd buy that. <laughs> he looked very, very young. He was 19 uh, and, at the time. Yeah. Yeah. The footage is up. Uh, the final round footage is up on YouTube for anyone who wants to check that out. Um, leading in, but yeah, so I'm not seeing a ton of necessarily created value on other names. I don't really see that. It's just names I like. And then if you want to pay a little bit of like Scotty insurance, I don't think it's the worst route because the odds are scaling in the way that you would expect. So it's kind of personal preference. Um, and as someone who is a little bit more risk averse, I think that this market, these types of markets are appealing. For sure. And I think that general thought process is good. And I think that it helps that you're actually running a simulation here. So you kind of know like, okay, this actually is good value because my fear with this is it's same thing fear I have with like a top five, top 10 market where you're paying a tax for that fear. Um, mm -hmm. And like, I, I want to make sure I'm not, you know, things aren't being taken too far to account for that fear. Like what you see is you see higher hold, the more forgiving the market is. And I think this is, takes a kind of similar approach. So that's why to me, it's reassuring you have, you're creating your own numbers here because you can actually test that with the market and decide, is it fair of value? Fitzpatrick 35 to one in the winner without Scotty market. So potentially pretty enticing there. Um, you mentioned Xander. He is seven to one here. Colin Morikawa checking in at 12 to one as well. I think also what you see there though is Rory. I, I love him, but he's a little uh, we bit gotta old. no, we gotta reassess Rory. We said we were out that's, last night, but um well, the called off divorce narrative, that's a massive bump up. I know everyone is saying like misogynists were saying like, oh, he got divorced. It's a bump up. But like, nah, it's actually the the reverse, the reverse divorce calling it off. That's where he gets a bump up. So we thought Rory was shortening because John Rahm withdrew. Rory was shortening because he's getting the the post potential divorce narrative bump, which is a pretty impactful one in my personal narrative model. Well, OK, you can do all the narrative stuff as, as whatever, whatever your bit is there. But it's just not a because <laughs> just because uh, Scotty might be a little bit overvalued. <clears throat> um, Rory, some other names still are overvalued. So it's not just one one golfer who's overvalued here. So in the to, to put a bow on what you were talking about with taking Scotty out, there's still other golfers I'm finding personally overvalued. And that's still creating value for uh, some of the names that I like for just pure outrights anyway. So let's talk about it. What are your favorite outrights this week? So it's a U.S. Open. It's a major week. Um, I'm excited for it, but uh, I have a little bit larger of a betting card than normal, and it's a little bit skewed toward the top of the field, but it's not, you know, you can make this card work uh, for you um, with proper bankroll management. So it's a little bit more, um, I mean, I'd go with five outrights, two two of them being long shots that I would consider, uh, but I'm going back to Xander Trofle at, 10 to one. I wanted this number to lengthen back to 11 to one, but with ROM out, that was never going to happen. Um, but I'm still good with it. He hits it far and straight. That's going to be crucial this week. He's top 15 in all four strokes gain stats over the last 50 rounds. Nobody else can say that in this field. You want to talk about balance. Then you talk about Xander Schauffele or balance and excellence combined. Uh, that's basically what Xander does, and that's how he gets into contention. He also plays U.S. Opens extremely well. Uh, just no bad finishes in U.S. Opens ever. He's the field leader in strokes gain per shot from 150 plus over the last 12 months, according to Data Golf. So if you're looking at longer approaches, that's something that we keyed in on for the PGA Championship. He excels there. Um, sand stats are really tricky to kind of implement but he is really good out of the sand so again i talked about not being able to knock scotty for anything i don't think you can knock xander for anything especially with some of the pressure off after winning the pga championship he did bounce back 
or about like come back, whatever, however you want to say. Um, was Tatum and Moro did a lot of the damage with the putter. The ball striking wasn't particularly great, but a one week blip for someone who's such a good ball striker long term. I'm not going to overthink that one. Colin Morikawa is another name that I like. And yes, it's it's a bit excessive here to go with someone at 10 to 1 and 14 to 1, but that's kind of where I'm capping things um, among the favorites. And you can, again, you can still make this work if you want, or you can pick one or the other. Um, because Morikawa was available at longer odds earlier, but at 14 to 1, that's where I find the breaking point with him for me. Uh, he did shorten again after the John Rom withdrawal uh, because, you know, I, it's it's unfortunate because Rom was helping create some extra value. Yeah. But Morikawa, I think, is is set up really well for this event. He's accurate off the tee. The iron plays on the upswing again. I think it's going to be pretty vital this week. You got to land it in the right areas. Colin Morikawa at his best can probably just remind us that he at times looks like the best golfer in the world and the putter is really really good right now um he is a 77th percentile putter from within 15 feet this season he's eighth around the green over the last uh 50 rounds as well i think people don't quite realize that with morikawa so i'm okay going one or the other i'm okay with going both because then from there th things get a bit longer and so long as your card is structured properly uh you can kind of go from there and I assume between the two, Xander's your preference at 10 to 1? Oh, no, maybe not. So there's a big I asked you this. I asked you this at the PGA Championship, and you said both to your. And you, I think you picked Brooks over between the two. So I don't remember if it was Brooks specifically, but you said, uh, you, you, you know, you said both. So I'm trying to bait you into the same thing here so we can guarantee victor for Xander, despite the fact, again, Rory has already guaranteed victory. I'm going to go Morikawa at the okay, number. Okay, okay. I think it's really hard to downplay what he's doing underneath. And he 14 to 1 is still a good number for me. Okay, I like it. So Morikawa 14, Shafley 10. You're betting just one. Brandon leans towards Morikawa there. What about other outrights? Some longer shots you like this week? Uh, Tommy Fleetwood talking about golfers who do everything well, but maybe nothing phenomenal. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood, 40 to one. He's got three top fives at us opens. The other results haven't been necessarily great, but he can put it together. Um, unlike a lot of other golfers. And when things get tough, I think that brings out some of the best in uh, Tommy Fleetwood. If you look at just the, the toughest courses played over the last two years, he stands out there. He's I believe 11th in strokes gained. Um, among this field on just the toughest courses over the last 24 uh, months. That's very, very reassuring. And again, he doesn't really have a dominant trait. I get that, but that might be the type of golfer who kind of elevates this week. So someone who it's not about how, how do you make birdie? It's about how do you avoid bogey and a game like Fleetwoods is pretty ripe for that. Uh, and then, you know, when you talk about the putter, it's there. 65th percentile putter from within 15 feet. Uh, you know, he's pretty accurate and long. So like a lot, a lot for me, a lot is making me think that Tommy Fleetwood is a good fit uh, for this week. And we can also shout out the no laying up specials uh, with Tron Carter, the mega bonus, Tommy Fleetwood winner without Scheffler, McElroy, Shoffley and Morikawa still 25 to one. Take out the four big dogs. I think that's kind of an appealing market. Um, as well, TC picked Fleetwood, but didn't want to go full out. Right? Come on, <laughs> come on. <laughs> eh, what are you gonna do? Got to believe in uh, Tommy. Well, I also believe in another one of the the lads, Matt Fitzpatrick. Yes, this would be a second U.S. Open win for Fitzpatrick in three years, but you want to talk about someone who just doesn't necessarily stand out ever anywhere, but doesn't have any holes. It's Matt Fitzpatrick. You want to talk about someone who is going to have to think his way around a golf course. I think of Matt Fitzpatrick, the guy who's logged every golf shot. He's I was going to say he, he played here 10 years ago and I can guarantee you, he knows exactly what he did every single shot in that, in that event when he was night. Well, I guess we're going with the narrative of 10 years old, but yeah. Yeah. When he was 10. Um, and yeah, so just a T 48 back in 2014, but I'm, 
I would imagine he learned a lot from it. Uh, and frankly, like I think he's just playing better golf than people realize, even though the finishes aren't, aren't amazing. He just hasn't put a lot together, but his game is still what it is for Matt Fitzpatrick. So uh, the win in the win in 22 uh, as well at the U S open and then finishing T 17 gives him four top twenties and six starts. So he's played U S opens pretty well. So if it's Patrick at 50 to one, I'm there this week. And beyond that, I am having a hard time. I think one of the big dogs is going to win. I think you can consider like Fleetwood Fitzpatrick, a big dog. Maybe as we're looking at this board here, maybe make the cutoff like Wyndham Clark, uh, Sam Burns, something like that. He's not 80. Like he was 80 for like five minutes. He's down to 70 again. So it's like, I can't. Yeah. Like I, I tried to open, I tried to open an app to, to, to bet Wyndham at 80. And by the time I got that, he was 75. So like, I think the narrative is fully off this week. Uh, the running joke is Wyndham wins when he's 80 to one. You won at Pebble Beach and won last year's US Open at that number. He got there briefly. So maybe the narrative's still on, but I didn't personally bet him, whereas I did for those first two. So I think, again, narratives can be hard to read, but I think that I think we're out on Wyndham that now that he's, and I didn't get him at 80. Again, I, I I know the narrative and everything, but his game isn't particularly there for me. You um, tread lightly. Be careful. I and this is such a tame take, but I, I do think that this is going to be such a difficult setup. And there are, as we talked about yesterday uh, or Tuesday, I don't know when this is going live, but hopefully on Wednesday. So nobody no, gets it's confused. going live on Friday. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to uh, only there- keep in the bad takes. Anything you said that was right is out. You won't have to do a lot of editing then. <laughs> but I I have a hard, I, I see a lot of archetypes being able to contend or play mm-hmm. well. But after four rounds of this, I feel like one of the yeah. one of the top guys is going to be. Holding that trophy and that top guy being Wyndham Clark or Rory McIlroy, depending on which narrative you agree with more. OK, what about Nana rights? Where are you going for there this week? Uh, I got two top 20s and then, of course, some top end regions. My, my favorite. Uh, uh, Russell Henley, top 20 at plus 230. I think you can definitely make a case for top 10 plus 550. I did that yesterday, but this, I think, is going to be a uh, razor thin margins. One shot could could have like an eight golfer cluster. And um, I see value in both, but I just feel more comfortable with the top 20, knowing that Henley's distance is going to be a negative for him despite that he has played well in us opens recently with uh 13th missed cut and 14th so two top 15s in his last three us opens so i'm there uh with henley he's just a really good golfer when you take driver out of his hands and what i mean by that he's top he's top 30 in strokes gain approach around the green and putting over the last 50 rounds he's 62nd and off the tee so it's not even terrible but he's just short off the tee. He's really accurate. He's 10th there. And I think that could put him in position to hit fairways and have long irons in. And he's actually 19th in strokes gain per shot from 100 to 200 yards over the last 12 months. Drops down to 63rd from 150 plus. But, you know, we're looking at reasonable odds, plus 230, just a top 20. And if you want, I could see getting more aggressive at plus 550 for a top 10. But Henley is someone that I'm keying in on who probably plays better at U.S. Opens than people probably think. But just below him uh, on the board, but at the same number, Sepp Straka to finish top 20 as well, plus 230. We've been in on Straka since last week, and I'm not <laughs> I'm not leaving now. But he's, he finished <laughs> T5 uh, in back-to-back starts at the Charles Schwab in the Memorial did miss the cut at the PGA championship, but was T16 at the masters. If you look at his event by event logs or just longer samples, you see that the irons are really hot and Straka, whenever he kind of flashed was doing so much of it with the putter that I couldn't quite get there normally. But now the irons and the approach play just in general is way up. He's accurate off the tee, which isn't, I would rather be long than, than accurate here, but if you're really accurate, I'm okay with that too. And it's not like he's prohibitively short, did miss the cut at the last two U.S. Opens, but I'm not really comparing his form then to now because he's kind of a different golfer. He's a better golfer, and that's something that I think is always important. Whenever you look at sure past history, 
especially in like majors or especially like at Augusta or in us opens where the setups almost always meant to sort of test the same things. It matters, but you also have to factor in a change of form. Now moving into top region, uh, it's going to be Bezfest this week. Christian oh. Bezadenhoek, top African, plus 170. He's up against uh, your boy, Dean Burmester. Ooh, tough market, Our boy, man. Eric Van Royen, and oh, Casey man. Jarvis. Oh, he's plus 175. All right, let's take that. Um, I had him at plus 170, so maybe, I just, maybe my notes were wrong there. But either way, it's value. Over the last 50 rounds, according to Data Golf, Christian Bezadenhoek is averaging 1.47 true strokes gain per round. So rounded up 1.5. Burmester's at a 1.25. Eric Van Rooyen's just below a one. And then Jarvis is a minus one. Uh, he's played well in tough events. Again, I, I, I referenced the looking at tough events over the last 24 months. Plays well in them. He's just more tested um, as well. I think he's just a better golfer. Yes, Burmester nukes it. Eric Van Rooyen can kind of flash, but Long term here, Bezaden Hote is the better golfer, and I see value in this when I model this one out. And I'm going top Italian, uh, Matteo Manicero, top Italian plus 130. It's just a three golfer group against uh, the Molinari boys, Francesco and Eduardo. Uh, but Manicero on the DP World Tour, so formerly known as the European Tour, he comes in with a win, missed cut, T5 missed cut. T23 and T13. Francesco, what's he been up to? Well, four straight missed cuts on the PGA Tour, including the PGA Championship most recently. Uh, Eduardo doesn't have a top 40 since December, so 11 straight events for him. Over the last three months, there's six events for Manicero in the sample and, and Eduardo as well, and then five for Francesco. Manicero is at a plus 0.77 true strokes gain per round, according to Data Golf. Francesco is at a minus 0.6. So it's over a shot gap there. And then Eduardo's down at a minus 1.3. So yes, these odds aren't phenomenal or anything, but it's a three golfer group and it's another way to get exposure. I always love these top and regions for majors. Gives you a little bit extra uh, to look into. And again, when the value's there, then I'm there. It's not like I'm just picking stuff. Model this one out. Uh, Manicero should be about plus 115 or so. I am mad that you're making me making my my sons fight Dean Dean Burmester, Christian Bezadenhout and Eric Van Royen all three of them my darling boys uh but Bezadenhout plus 175 to be top african top italian Matteo Monacero plus 130 other stuff from Brandon Seb Straka and Russell Henley top 20 both those are top or plus 230 Matt Fitzpatrick to win 50 to 1 Tommy Fleetwood to win 40 to 1 Colin Morikawa 14 Xander 10 is the betting card for Brandon for this week that's all that we have here for today on covering the spread. Brandon, I want to thank you for joining us for today. Uh, enjoy the U S open. And we'll talk to you once again soon. As always. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. You can find Brandon on X at Cadula 13. I am on X at Jim Sonis. You can find FanDuel Research on X at FanDuel Research. Tomorrow, Tom Vecchia swings by talking about NBA Finals Game 4. We'll recap Game 3 tonight and then also go through Game Number 3 in the Stanley Cup Finals. We'll also have Dr. Ed Fang on later Thursday to preview the Euros in 2024. To get all that as it is posted, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Enjoy the golf this weekend. Good luck to your bets. We'll talk to you once again soon. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 